arrangements to be said to that our church know how to respond to her. Um, I think uh, the church is in drastic trouble when it shifts its responsibilities from members to popularity. Uh, the church is a place where people ought to be able to see they have Mother Rose here this morning, have to see her here this morning. That's what the church is all about. It's called the other theology. Jesus preached an, another theology that was learn how to take care of one another, see about one another. I wouldn't want to belong to a church that does not see about one to the other. It ceased from being the church when that does not take place because all we have is one another. Is that right? Let us pray. Father God, it's again we come today to ask that you would deploy more of your strength in the lives of those who are suffering loss, suffering from sickness. We ask today not only that, Meet us at our every day. Because I've discovered that many of us that we cannot make it without you. No man's advice is better than what the scripture has already suggested. Thank you for being with us all night long, early morning, rising. Thank us, thank you for supplying us all last week. We look for the pantry to be refilled this week. We, we look for your blessings to travel with us all week long once again. We, we look uh, for you to guide us and to take care of us. Sometimes our emotions get in the way of your power and strength. Help us to see you more clearly even in the midst of of what we all are experiencing in our own personal lives today. You've never left us, never left us, never will you leave us, nor will you leave us alone. Thank you for your grace and loving kindness and tender mercy. And for that, we say thank you. Thank you, Lord. Somebody standing around the altar, even in the pulpit today, even in the choir stand, needing a double dose of your goodness. We pray, God, that you will help us to see you, that you've been providing for us even right now. There are those who are sick and shut in, those who are in hospitals, nursing homes, the drug habits some cannot be. We ask that you would break those yokes and give strength that is needed in those areas. Today, God, we worship you in spirit and truth because you've been kind to us. You've been better to us than we have been to ourselves. Some of us have taken you for granted. But when we look at how far you have brought us, we can't help but say thank you. When we look at how you have provided, we can't help but say thank you. When we look at how you healed us, can't help but say thank you. When we look at how you brought us through bereavement, we can't help but say thank you. When we were down to our last dime, you made ways out of no way. We could not help but say thank you. Today we say thank you for the worship hour where we can pour our souls out to you. That you would touch us in the areas that we need to be touched. Lifted in the areas that we need to be lifted. Comfort in the areas that we need comfort. And I bless our worship. In Christ's name we pray.
give up? Sometimes it gets hard, but don't give up on God. Cause he won't give up. I'll never leave you, no one I can say. Don't give up on God. Cause he won't give up on you. Even in the midnight hour.
God our Father, we come to ask that you would help us today to relate to your people the Word of God and to apply it and make it applicable in our lives. We're going to give you glory for it. We all need your help. We cannot do it alone. And for that, we you to step in wherever you need to step in <laughs> to give remedy to our situations. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Second Kings <coughs> chapter number 20 2 Kings chapter 20. I'll be reading from the NIV for a much more simpler way of giving some clarity. In those days, Hezekiah became king <coughs> and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to see excuse me, went to him and said, this is what the Lord says, put your house in order because you're going to die. You will not recover. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully with uh, wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes and Hezekiah wept bitterly. Before Isaiah had left uh, the middle of court, the word of the Lord came to him, go back and tell Hezekiah, the ruler of my people. This is what the Lord, this is what the Lord the God of your father David says, I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you. Yes. On the third day, from now you will go up to the temple of the Lord. And I will add 15 years to your life. And I will deliver you and the city from the hands of the city king. king of Assyria, and I will defeat this city for my sake and the sake of my servant David. I want to talk this morning, maybe seated. I want to talk briefly to you this morning, if you allow me to do that this morning. I want to talk about uh, getting right with God. Brothers and sisters, we live in a world where everybody has discovered and manufactured what is right in their own mind. Many times we have decided to do what is right because it has become easy for us to design and package our own ways of righteousness. Some of us have gotten to the place to where we have developed a habitual habit of becoming self-righteous. A self-righteous person is a person that has impaired vision, impaired hearing, and their heart is almost turned to stone because they have developed uh, every answer for their solution, every answer for their problem. Uh, they feel that their advice for self is the only advice that is needed. Many of us, whether we believe it or not, we have tried to live that way. We have tried to satisfy ourselves in a way of creating our own righteousness that only satisfies us. 
But in the long haul, and at the end of the day, we discover that which we tried to create for ourselves does not work out for the betterment, for the betterment of our progress and the lives in which we live now. I like the text this morning because the text uh, has so many implications. When I look at the text, there was an argument among theologians that God changed his mind about Hezekiah. I stopped by to tell people today, if God said it, he's going to do it. I want people to be clear that, that God has never made a mistake in any decision that he has made in your life and in my life. The problem is, we have misunderstood what God is literally trying to tell us about what it is he would have us to do. What I'm saying is God is omnipotent, he's omnipresent, and there is no mutability about God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So, Never look at this text in the context that God changed his mind about Hezekiah. What God did was he had the prophet address Hezekiah, who was sick unto death. The same sickness that Hezekiah had, the Assyrians had, they had the bubonic plague. And the bubonic plague in that day was a death sickness. God sent the man of God to him to tell him he was going to die and there would be no recovery. But soon as the prophet leaves, Hezekiah turns his face and has a conversation with a wall. Metaphorically speaking, he has a conversation with God. Look at what he does. He does not ask God to spare him. But what he does is he gives God his resume of servanthood. He tells God that I've been faithful. I've worshipped you. I've done everything you've asked me to do. And at this particular time, if you want to do what you want to do, it is well with your soul. And the text said, after he gave his resume to God, that he wept. Not only shortly after that, as the prophet leaves the threshold of his home and he gets to the middle court, God speaks again to the prophet. He says, go back to Hezekiah and tell him, I did not change my mind. I just heard his prayer. Y'all miss me. He did not change his mind. Tell him I did not change my mind. I just heard his prayer. And tell him that, that uh, he can get up in a few days and he can go to the high place, the place in which he destroyed why sin had come on his body. The high place. Never destroy your high place. There's refuge in your, your high place. There's the relief of pain and struggle and suffering in your high place. So when I look at the text this morning, we find out that God had heard his prayer. Isn't it amazing when God comes to you, describes your condition, tells you through the man of God that there's no hope you're going to die. And all of a sudden you pray to God and God hears your prayer. And then God turns that thing all the way around just because you had a conversation with God. See, some of you all are having the wrong, the, the, the wrong conversation with the wrong person. Look at your life now because you have had conversations with the wrong people who seem to have the zeal of God but did not know him according to knowledge. I like the text because the text illustrates in the King, in King Hezekiah all uh, that all of us need to take heed to. The subject matter that we're talking about is 
this morning, after we look at his life, after he prayed, after God uh, got him straightened out, gave him 15 more years, uh, restored worship to his life, uh, he did something that many of us are afraid to do. We are literally afraid to look at our own selves in the sight of God. And the reason why we are afraid to look at our own selves in the sight of God is because we feel we made the best decision for our life. None of us can ever make the best decisions for our life if we are called children of God without asking for divine intervention for every decision that we make. Did you not know that there's some things in my life that I struggle with today because I made the decision without divine intervention? Let me say it to you this way. Some of you are looking at me right there today. You are where you are today in some areas and aspects of your life because you made some decisions without divine intervention. And so they, I thought I'd stop by to tell and preach this old subject matter that's been preached in the church for a long time. Uh, you need to get right with God. Whether you believe it or not, some of us feel we're already there. But I just stopped by to tell you, you might think you're there, but let a storm rise. Let your finances get low. Let sickness get in your body. Let, let trouble get in your home. You'll discover that you didn't have what you thought you had. Am I preaching yet? So I want all of us to know from the pulpit to the back door, uh, from the choir stand to the pulpit to the back door, anywhere in this facility where my voice is being heard, all of us need to have a Hezekiah experience. Right, right. All of us need to be arrested to the point to where God speaks to us by way of Holy Spirit, by way of illumination of the word, to check on our readiness. You do know he's coming back. Whether you believe it or not, you might live like he's not coming back, but the Lord is coming back. Matter of fact, he might be here quicker than many of us uh, think he is. But, but, but I just want people to know today that every day we live, we ought to be striving to get right with God. Can I get a witness? Some of you have spent a lot of time trying to get right with somebody that can't treat you like the Lord. Oh my I stopped by the day to tell you uh, that uh, that's going to run out. That, that, that's going to run out. As soon as uh, your money runs out, they run out. As soon as your influence runs out, they run out. As soon as what you have that draws the attention of other people, when it runs out, it runs out. Where will you go when it runs out? So, I try to live every day, and I hope you will from this day forward, trying to get right with God. It's, and I want people to know that that is a difficult issue. It's a difficult position to take, to try to live your life every day, allowing God to manifest himself in your life to where God can look at you and see his own righteousness being manifested in you. It's hard to live in this world. Drug infested, alcohol infested, sexually infested, sick, sin sick, and yet realize I still need to get right with God. I know things are going pretty well for you, but I just stop by to tell all of us this morning that no matter what's going on in our lives, we cannot afford to live a day, each day, every hour, trying to have a good relationship with God. I think the church is plagued with that. I think the church is plagued with people who, who go to church but they don't have a relationship with God that signifies that they're trying to get right with you. Yeah. Some of us don't want to be right with God because it's too demanding on our lives. But we say we want to get right with God. It takes away some of the things that we want to do. When you say you really want to get right with God, it really says that God's will and your will are not in conjunction with one another. When you say you want to get right with God, it, it basically says that, that, that uh, uh, I'm going to relinquish who I am 
and allow the new creature to come forward. When, when you say, when you say you want to get right with God, you're going to allow God to intervene in every aspect of your life. When you, when you say you want to get right with God, you're literally saying, I have no more will. I operate under the jurisdiction of God's will. When you really say that you really want to get right with God, you know how to say no to those things that infect the relationship that you have with God. When you say you want to get right with God, you do like Hezekiah. You'll be able to say, I can turn my face to the wall and I can tell God about the service that I rendered to him. And a few hours later, God will restore you and heal you. When you say you really want to get right with God, what you're literally saying is, God, whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, however you want me to talk, I'm willing to do that. So some of us, let me say it this way, don't know how to get right with God. Isn't it amazing that you know how to do a lot of things in life, but you have a problem getting right with God? I don't know why you have that problem. I don't know why I have issues in the righteousness of God flowing. I, I understand that. I, I can literally understand that. But, but, but I think uh, uh, God does not have to take us to a bubonic plague era in our lives to help us to see that we ought to get right with Him. Uh, God does not have to take us through COVID-19 and and all of this for us to know that we, we, we ought to get right with him. Just by you being here today and seeing how God has blessed you, made ways in your life that were unable to be made, provided for you when, things, when provisions were low, give you things and gave you things that you did not deserve, you ought to want to get right just because he's been good to you. Y'all not hearing me, y'all. I don't think you're really hearing me, what I'm saying, what I'm, what I'm saying. I, I, don't, I really don't think you, you're hearing me. I, I think you're satisfied where you are. I think you're happy living your life where you are. I, I, I think you, you, you've gotten to the place to where you have become complacent in the progressive spiritual walk that God wants you to have. You're happy because you got money in the bank. You got your house paid for. All of that temporary stuff. I have never seen a mortgage follow somebody to a graveyard. I have never seen a car payment follow somebody to a graveyard. I have never seen a, 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 a bank truck or a vault truck follow somebody. Naked you came into this world and naked you going out of it. Are you satisfied with yourself? 
Are you happy with yourself? Are, are you ecstatic about the decisions you made about yourself? Are you living a life today uh, that wraps, is wrapped up, tied up in yourself? When we look at the text, Hezekiah was sick. He had the same disease that the Assyrians had that were attacking the people of Jerusalem. He was going to die. He was in a place where healing would not be provided, provided for him. But when he turned and looked at himself, Things can change for you when you look at yourself. Your drama in your life, my brothers and sisters, other people might be involved in it, but it is something you decided to participate in. Hello, somebody. Stop blaming me for your drama. Stop blaming me for your spiritual out altitude. Stop, stop blaming other people where you are. You need to look at yourself and when you look at yourself, here's what you might find. You're going to find that I ain't what I thought I was. I ain't. You ain't. Yeah, we dressed up this morning. We're looking good. But as Mama would say, we're raggedy as a bear on a crab on the inside. So much so until you can get hired because of an impressive resume. And after the investigation of the resume is done, you can get fired. <laughs> so don't allow the resume. If you used to haul garbage, say I used to be a garbage engineer. <laughs> He was not afraid to look at his own personal 
resonates. Some of us are afraid when it comes to getting right with God to look at what we have done. Now, what I like about him is, I love this about him, when he began to talk about his resume, he talked about his spiritual relationship with God. Right. He didn't talk about the battles he won. He didn't talk about his socialization of his kingship. He did not talk about how many subjects were under his hand. He did not talk about how many cities he conquered. He did not talk about how much money was in Jerusalem's coffers. He, he did not talk about that. What he talked about is his relationship with God. The text says that he walked with him. The text says that he talked with him. The text says that he was intimate with him. The text says that they talked regularly together. The text says that he was faithful to God. The text says that no matter what he done wrong, he didn't let his wrong replace the righteousness of God that was in his life. Have you ever looked at your spiritual resume? Oh Lord. Oh my God. Here's what some people's resume would look like. It says, your spiritual resume says, he introduces yourself, then he talks about. Worship. The first thing on your spirit is when it comes to God is worship. I go to church. Christmas, Easter, Mother's Day. My worship is only four times a year. Worship. Your servanthood. I go to the church picnic. I would too if I was going to eat. <laughs> How does your resume look? Well, I left because I was church hurt. I stopped serving because I got church hurt. I don't believe in church hurt. I believe was, you was hurt when you got into church. Yeah. You know, stop blaming me. Take that off. You know, I went to the church and Somebody was sitting in my seat. I asked them to move, and they got smart with me. That hurt my feelings. And I, and I was hurt, so I went to another church. I was teaching Bible study, and the pastor told me I was in the book for two years, and he changed the book, and, and, and I went to another church. That's church. They say that's church hurt. I, I don't go there because they hurt me. Listen, you were hurt when you came in here. You had some things that were suppressed in you when you came in here. Because if you are a child of God and you've been walking and talking with him like this, could you imagine if, 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 if Hezekiah would have said that he was hurt in Jerusalem? Say that. He just gave what he did for the Lord. We don't do that. We blame everybody. Well, I, I put serving on the usher board because she said something or he said something I didn't like. I, I don't sing no more because they, they don't sing what I want them and they don't sing what I like. And I don't like who's directed anymore. I don't come to 11 o'clock service at 8 because I don't like the preacher. And I, I don't do this because uh, 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 I don't like how the deacon prays. They pray too long. They sang too long. They hold worship too long. Uh, when you was down at the NBA last week, you stayed down there as long as you wanted to. Some of you just got in from AJ's Lounge. Wherever you've been, and you stayed as long as you want. And, 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 and go places you go, and you, you stay as long. As, as, as the entertainment and the joy of the spirit of your flesh is there, you stay there as long. But when it comes to church, hurry up, man. Get done. I got something I want to do. I, I got, you know, hurt. Get done. Get done. Get, get done. No, no. I, I, what I'm saying in that, in that context is you need to be conscious of the fact, what if God would cut you off? 
What, what, what if God gave you a time to leave? What, what if God said, well, I'm cutting you off today. Now, I'm going to carry you till Tuesday. Wednesday, you out on your own. Uh, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, come, if you come Sunday, I'll fill you up again. But, but, but what if God said that he was going to cut you off like you cut him off? Some of us don't have spiritual personal resumes because God is not that important to us. He's only important when we get sick and when we need money and when we need our heads lifted and we need our children straightened out. He's only good when he can do something for us. But I've learned to say he's good as low as I've been. I've learned to say no matter how painful life has become that God is still good anyhow. You all heard Rosie talk about the yet of God. Some of y'all don't, don't understand that. Uh, you've been through something. I've had some pain. I've had some struggle. you had a Hezekiah experience, but yet you lost your house. You lost your car. You don't have clothes to wear, no money in the bank, but yet you've been sick. You've been hurting. You're by yourself. You can't feel the power of God, but yet God has made a way for you. your personal resume. See what the psalmist said, what shall I render to God for all he's done for me? What shall I give him? And anything I give him goes on my resume. Y'all like him. You're afraid to look at yours because there ain't nothing on it. resume is the benefits of being a Christian. When I look at on my resume, the, the benefits of being a child of God is that he woke me up this morning. Did you know the benefits of being a child of God is knowing that it is he who sustains you? Do, do you really know the benefits of being a child of God? It's not about what you wear, what you drive, where you're headed, where you're going. It's about being in relationship with him. Do you really know? I know you know the benefits of working for an employer, but do you really know the benefits of God? Eternal life, abundant life, secure life, sanctified life, a holy life. That's The prophet gives him a prescription on how to get up after he's been healed. Let me read it to you. Verse 6 says, I will add 15 years. Now here it is. He says, verse 5, I heard your prayer. I've seen your tears. I will heal you. The third day from now, you will go up. There it is. To the temple of the Lord. Y'all missed that. He gives him a prescription how to react when he gets up from the healing. Huh? Y'all not hearing me. He said, go up to the temple of God. He was sick. Boils, the bubonic plague, and the boils were on his body. He was weakened. Now he's rejuvenated. And he didn't say, lay there and speak to me. He says, get up and go up. He says, go up to the house of the, to the temple of the Lord. Uh, Y'all not hearing me. Go to the place that you destroyed in the house. Go, go, go back to where you first met me. Go, go back. Go. go. Have, have you ever went back where you first met the Lord? Oh my God! I, I remember when I when I first met the Lord. It's been so many years ago. 
but yet I still remember it today. I remember the day when I had walked down front with tears in my eyes. And they asked me that I believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, and when I accept him as my personal Savior. And I've been running from the Lord ever since, and I ain't got tired yet. And, and, and the reason why, why I'm running from the Lord because I was dead in sin. And when I met him, he healed me. And when I got healed, I've been running to Jesus, and I ain't tired. God has made a way for some of you all. Uh, God has healed your body. God has raised you up and you had not went up to the temple yet. God has, has, has cured people of cancer in here and has regulated their diabetes and has brought them through uh, uh, successful operations and, 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 and regulated their blood pressure and, and, and gave them medication for their troubled mind and you haven't went up to the temple yet. God has uh, uh, healed your body. He straightened your leg down and took the, the sciatic out of uh, pain out of your, your nerve. And he did all of that but you ain't been to the temple yet. God has done so much for you. He, he made ways for you. He's put food in your cupboard, money in your pocket and you ain't even been to the temple yet. God has lifted you up from places of despair and pain and, and struggle, but you ain't even been to the temple yet. God has made a way for you when the way could not be seen nor be made, and you have not been to the temple yet. Mm. Yes, sir. But yet, get into another jam. Oh, yes. Now here's what's so good about that when you do. He don't forsake you, you forsake him. I don't understand God. I hope I can have a consultation with him after he judges me. Because <laughs> I'm going to be judged. So God, how do you keep putting up with us? How do you keep putting up with us and doing for us? And we act like we don't give up. God, why? Why do you keep making ways for us? Fixing things in our families, our homes, our jobs, our lives. And, 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 and you still, you do it time after time. Tell me why you did that. He just references himself and says, for God so loved me. He references his own text and says, well, I so love the world that I gave my only begotten son. I'm in the son. I ain't talking about the S-U-E. I'm talking about the son, the S-O-E. I'm in him when I'm down. I'm in him when I'm in the tween. I'm in him when I'm up. I'm in him. I'm in him. I'm in him. I enjoy. Paul talks about being in Christ. text and I tried to reference the event at Calvary. And I reached the conclusion that even after the ministry of Jesus Christ, those three hundred those three years and the lives that he's touched, he still was not right with God. After all he did for mankind, Prior to Calvary, he still was not right with God. How does the Messiah, how does the anointed one, the Emmanuel, born in a manger, came through 4,200 generations, turned water into cognac, took a few loaves and fed four and five thousand. Even handled the daughter of the South Phoenician woman and raised Jairus' daughter. 
Yet he still was not right with God. How, how, how did he, how did he do what he did for those three uh, substantial, extraordinary years of ministry, but yet he was not right with God? How did he get right with God? The text says that they whipped him all night long. The text says that they moved him from judgment hall to judgment hall. The text says that they spit on him. The text says they customized a cross for him. The text says that he came down to Via de la Rosa, hung between two worlds, died. The text says he hung there from the sixth to the ninth hour. The data says that he died. And when he died, oh yes, they put him in a tomb for three days. And he got up from the grave. And when he got up from the grave, he made it right with his father. Not my will, but let your will be done. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will stand. I'm glad he died. I'm glad he got right with God. And because he got right with God, it makes it possible for me to get right with God. Get right with God. And let's do it now. Get right with God. He can show you how. Get right with God. He'll make a way for you. Get right with God. He'll be your bridge over troubled waters. Get right with God. Food in a barren land. Get right with God. Clothe you when you're naked. I'm glad he died. But the good news is he got up from the grave. With all Thank you, Hezekiah, for your experience. You showed us how to get right with God. Some of y'all want to get right with the church. How are you going to get right with a hospital, a mental institution, a rehabilitation center? You're going to get right with that. You better get right with God. Stand with me all over this facility. Let me do it this way. If you're lost, you can be found today. That's the first thing I want to say. The scripture says that the person comes and confess Jesus Christ as personal Savior. He will know why cast you out of Satan. And not only will he say you, he'll classify you as a convert. But it is not his wish or joy that you remain a convert, but that you travel the journey of development of becoming a child of God and a disciple. I want to offer him to you today. You can be found. Is there one that will first give their life to Jesus Christ? Secondly, you might have been busy with this church for some time. What is it going to take for you to make this your home? Let me tell you what it takes. Is you making a decision and saying, I want to be under the cover of this church and this pastor. Just come on down front. There's somebody here that has lost their way. I want you to know that you can find it right here. Pray. God bless you. Thank you.
This relationship that I'm talking about is not like a relationship with a man. You know, you can't play nobody with this relationship. If you try to play with this relationship, you're going to lose. This is a relationship that gives you redemptive life, gives you security of salvation, it gives you everything you need from a God that gives you salvation. So if you're here today, why don't you give me a Make a decision. Be man enough. Be woman enough to do it. Here's the good news about it. It's an individual thing. You don't have to wait on her. You don't have to wait on him. Just come to the Lord just as you are. It's a personal thing. Can I get a witness? Anybody know it's a personal thing? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Maybe be seated. Could you stand and tell them who you are? Uh, my name is Jasmine. Are you saved? Um, I am saved. But I need to be saved again. Okay, now listen to me. I'm going to help you. If you say you're saved, you'll confess Christ as a personal Savior. You're saved. You can tell what the problem is. All of us got that problem. No, no. Every day is a day of healing. And I'm gonna be, I might not ever see you again, I hope I do, but I just want you to know the reason why you feel like what you feel because you've let bad decisions stand between you and God. Would you agree with that? Yes. Yeah, a lot of us don't ever want to admit that because we want people to think that we're confident and we're smart enough to handle our lives. And that's all it is. I, you just let things get in the way of the relationship. You, let, you didn't prioritize God. And so now you have an opportunity to prioritize him. And say, I want him to be first. And now that's going to take some time because you've been doing it your way for what? Ever. Uh, it was a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we're going to pray with you that God would be restoring you the joy of salvation. Now, when you get restored, God goes through your backpack and you got one on, I see it. You got a lot of junk in your backpack. And so now you got to open it up and let God empty it so he can fill it with what you need. All right? We're going to pray for you. Have a seat. Stan, who are you, my friend? My name is Scott. Who? Scott. Scott, and your name? Taylor. Taylor. And y'all hooking up y'all together? One, that's your boyfriend. All right. What's your name? Okay. When you got a pacifier, you can't talk. All right. Did you smile? Okay. All right. What do y'all need? You want to be saved? You say, are y'all saved? And you just need the church home. Now let me tell you what this church is going to do for you. If you get into Bible studies, if you get into the ministries of this church, it's going to help you respect her more and ask her to marry you. And it's going to put you in a place to where you respect him more. To where you might say yes. You hear me? These are y'all stupid. Let me tell you about that lifestyle. Okay? I, I, I ain't calling you out. I'm trying to help you. That's why a lot of people, they don't like coming down here and they leave. I would, I, I'm a product of a, a daddy and a mom in the home. If you all can make that happen for your children, you need to do that. Kids are becoming so confused. Some of these girls dress better than I do. I, I think you know what I'm talking about. You can't tell the girl from her. You got a chance to help him be what he's supposed to be and not be confused and him to be what he's supposed to be and not be confused. And guess who makes that possible? The Lord makes it possible. 
So y'all still want to join? But I better ask you. Okay. God bless you. And uh, happy to be your pastor. And believe it or not, I'm a pretty good one. You know, uh, I told Marie, when you start questioning if you was a good mother or not, chances are you're a good mother. God bless you. Have a seat. We'll get you going here in a minute. Wendy lost her son. And uh, we're going to pray. Y'all want to come pray with her? Uh, if you'd like to, anybody like to come? Give her some strength. That's it. That's it. Yeah, the other one passed some time ago. 1999, lost both of her boys. Yeah. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. You know that one? That's it. That sounds good. Just sing a little bit. No 
whether that position should be an elected position or an appointed position. So we probably need to have some conversations about what that looks like and, and what have you. Um, Pastor, is it, is it okay if I talk about the U.S. Census a little bit? Yeah, okay. Because of that? Okay, thank you. Um, the U.S. Census, they are preparing for the upcoming census in 2030. Can't believe this. I mean, it's, we're going to blink and it's going to be here. So what the uh, US, uh, U.S. Department of Census, what they're working on is that they're sending out invitations to various households across the United States to have the households participate and gauge how they will be completing the census. Um, it's a research project, um, not looking to gather any personal information. It's more like how many people are in the household, that sort of thing. So there should be no personal information such as social security numbers or date birth or anything like that. Nothing identifiable, uh, I believe, is on the form. So if you do receive an invitation to participate in the survey, please do so, uh, because it helps gauge how the 2030 consensus will go, census will go, okay? So please, by all means, do participate in that research project. Thank you. To Pastor Moore and the Alamed Missionary Baptist Church with a special thanks. This extra, extra special thank you note sent to you today holds more appreciation than any words can say. For you're among the nicest people I have ever known, and you'll never be forgotten for the thoughtfulness you've shown. Thanks for everything, the family of Sonia Johnson, Sister Kimberly Cameron, and Sister Janetta Day. What you do with them celebration. And then I want to thank my pastor, Reverend Wayne L. Moore, and all of the Missionary Baptist Church for sticking by us so faithfully and so close. And I thank you for your prayers. Just continue to pray for me and my family. I mean, all of it, I am so proud of you. Y'all did so much, and I just thank you. And like I said, thank you. So we want to see what God says about temptation. And then also uh, every Monday night at 6 p.m. we do our, our prayer meeting. So I want to welcome you to join our prayer meeting as well. Amen. 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 Thank you, uh, Brother Clint, for the work you do. The prayer meeting the whole ministry is uh, doing a fantastic job so far this year. I hope you are progressing to do much, much more than you've already done. Today uh, is uh, our place in worship to where we are learning how to be consistent in our giving. Let me tell you, when we are consistent in our giving, we're able to do things around the church. And I hope that you will be a part of the tithing process here and the giving process here at the Alpha Baptist Church. It's very, very, very rarely that you can go to a church and see where your tithes are. I mean, it is in this church you can see that. And I want to thank you those who are watching virtually, thank you so much. I love you from the center of my heart. I hope you will continue to give and support this ministry to be a courageous, cutting edge ministry in the city of Indianapolis, especially on this side of town. Uh, let's do our best every week to bless God with our resources. Amen. Amen. Shall we get ready to give to the Lord? Our Bible studies in place, let me say that this week. Uh, we had a great opening on Wednesday night at 7 5. Noon was good as well. So let's get ready uh, to do that. Uh, here's how we do this you can go to uh, OMBC.org, click in the upper right hand button, uh, button, upper right hand corner, excuse me, and begin to give. You can go to Giveify. And once you go to Giveify, download the Giveify app. The Olive Missionary Baptist Church in Indianapolis, be clear, 
Indianapolis, Indiana. And not only that, you can mail, uh, come to the church Wednesday, Monday, Wednesdays, and Friday from 9.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. And you can also mail uh, to 4141 North High School Road, uh, 46254. Not only that, we want you to drop it in the uh, basket on your way out. Let me say this as a proud pastor. Every aspect of our ministry was with both of these families on Friday and Saturday. I want to thank you all for what you did to give comfort and strength to these families because I think uh, once we do that, uh, people can see uh, that we are a church where the Lord is magnified. Amen. Amen. Let us stand now. Because I tithe, God is faithful to his word. Because I tithe, God is faithful to his word. Because I tithe, God has been faithful to his word. Because I tithe, God is faithful to his word. Because I tithe, God has been faithful to his word. Because I tithe, God is faithful to his word. Because I tithe, God has been faithful to his word. Amen and amen. God bless you. Let us remain standing. Remember our Bible studies are in place this week. Remember to uh, tell somebody as you leave out uh, that you're going to pray for them and ask that they would pray for you. In the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, rest rule of the Bible, most hits now and forevermore. God bless you. Go in peace.